what I'm talking about. I was raised as a Baptist, and I converted to Islam. So I know both sides of the fence. I'm not speaking to you as a Muslim who knows absolutely nothing about Christianity. I was born and raised as a Christian. And the thing is, is that even Christians amongst themselves, you know, you have Protestants who believe that they're better than Baptists, Baptists who believe that they're better than this one, this one. And in Islam, we have the same thing. Sufis believe that the truth is with them and they are the ones that are going to paradise, right, to heaven. And they are God's chosen people, right? And Sufis believe the same thing. Shiites believe the same thing. And with each belief system, there are a set of behaviors that are attached to those beliefs. And so when someone draws a picture of Prophet Muhammad, you know, insultingly and making mockery of someone's faith, you have to believe that within that group of people that, that are called Muslims, and the different sects that are amongst them, that there are some people who are not going to take, and, and it doesn't matter, we can speak out against the terrorist, terrorist acts, we can speak out until we're blue in the face, this is not going to change anything. Where does it start? Where does the change start? Because I'm a solution-oriented person. I don't like to just keep blabbing, you know, and, and we're not really getting anywhere. What is the solution to this? People come from, Muslims come from certain countries where if you were to insult Prophet Muhammad, they would murder you in the streets. I, I, was, I remember being in school in Saudi Arabia and there was an argument between two students. One said if Prophet Muhammad was alive today, he would wear the regular clothes of the people in his environment. The other one said no, he wouldn't. He would wear the standard Saudi dress, which is the white long thobe, which you see he may have you wearing now, right? Said, no, he would wear this. And I mean, literally in the hallway getting ready to fight to the point where one got upset and he declared the other one to be an infidel. You're a Catholic. You're, you're a disbeliever. Because he said Prophet Muhammad would wear the regular clothes of the people in his environment. A small argument like that could escalate to the point where a Muslim would call another Muslim an infidel. So what do you think is going to happen when we release this individual out into the world and someone from another faith just happens to, you know, say whatever he feels about Prophet Muhammad? These ideologies, they exist. You cannot kill an ideology. You can, you can as many planes as you want, as many bombs as you want, you cannot kill an ideology. Ideologies don't die. They are inherited by another group of people, so that is our starting point, and that is to change the beliefs of the understandings of people who believe that it is okay to spill someone's blood simply because they insulted you or they spoke their mind or they said something about you that you dislike. That is where it starts. And we have issues like that right here in America. If you was to say something about my mother right now, I would get offended and, you know, God knows best where that conversation would end. But we see this all day long. I pick my children go to junior high school. There are fights up there every day. And what are those fights over? Because someone said something about this one, someone said. So we have a problem. That problem exists right here in America. Right here next door. I live in the buildings right here next door. There were two people that were murdered just a couple of nights ago. Two people murdered in the parking lot. Why? Because most likely somebody said something that I didn't like. So this is, this is a universal problem. This is not an Islamic problem for we to make Muslims in Islam the bad guys, right? This, we're always looking for a boogeyman. We're always looking for someone that you know, we're in fear of, that we're scared of, right? Because fear motivates people. There are two motivating factors, right, that the media uses. Fear and love, compassion. And I mean, we want to be more compassionate as Muslims, and we want to fight against these you know, ideologies and these concepts. But I think it's important that we, you know, put everything in perspective and understand that, um, oh, okay, I'm at 12 minutes already. You should stop me. <laughs> Thank you guys, you guys have been great. I'm sorry for my rambling, but, you know, this is something that I get very passionate about. I don't know whether I'm violating your freedom of speech, but... <laughs> The yes. uh, next speaker is my old friend John Sweeney. Uh, I think on the Day of Judgment I owe John a lot. <laughs> I like what I think, and he publishes a lot of it. And then he gets a lot of heat back. 
Occasionally he shares some of it with me, but he, he shields me from all the backlash that the news journal gets. But I want to really uh, commend him and the news journal uh, for publishing. I've published more than 100, 100, 140 pieces in the last seven years in the news journal, and all of them tend to excite somebody or the other. So, so as far as I'm concerned, he has defended my right to speak freely for seven years. And so, John Sweeney. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I would like to, to say a few words about cartoons as a person who has to uh, deal and deal with and make judgments about cartoons every day. I'm the editorial page editor, and I have to select a cartoon to run with the paper. Sometimes I have space in the newspaper or online to run more than one, one cartoon. Let me just back up for a second and point out that the word media is a plural. Um, there, news organizations, entertainment organizations, or individuals um, are different. The news journal is not the same thing as the New York Times, which is obvious. It's not the same thing as the Baltimore Sun. It's not the same thing as the Newark Post. Uh, it is not the same thing as channels 3, 6, or 10 in Philadelphia, CNN, or Fox News. Uh, likewise, the media, uh, the names that have popped up, uh, John Stewart, uh, uh, Bill Maher, and so forth, and other comedians, uh, back and forth commentators, so they, they're different. And to show my ignorance and my isolation, until the attack last week, I had never heard of Charlie Ebna. So, uh, but cartoons, uh, and the way I have learned to treat cartoonists, they are just the same as columnists. It's a point of view. Uh, each news organization, as opposed to the entertainment organizations and so forth, have its own, has, uh, each has its own set of values and ethics and rules that it, it goes by. Uh, for example, uh, in our paper, we're trying to reach as many Delawareans as we can. Um, and my personal taste and my personal uh, standards come in is I avoid, as much as I can, uh, cartoons that have anything to do with religion. Um, it, a couple of times when I've been on vacation, people have selected cartoons that created other problems for, for me. But generally, it, it's the same thing. I, I do not want to see cartoons um, that belittle someone's weight, for example, making someone, uh, making fun of someone for uh, their appearance, um, or using a cliche, whether the person is uh, uh, a, a born-again Christian, a member of the Tea Party, or a Muslim. The cartoons that come across, and look at maybe 50 a day, they will come in and the cartoonists are not always on the spot. There are some cartoonists I don't like. It's over, but I will make the judgment, looking at the news value of the cartoon and the point. I have a couple of favorite cartoonists that we subscribe to, for example. That's another thing is I can only run the cartoons that I pay for. Right? That's a big limitation. But the two cartoonists that I happen to like have very defined political point of view, points of view. They are, I think, good artists that the, the point gets across. And they, uh, they will hit the money day after day. You know, I'm not gonna pick them every day. But one is a conservative, Lisa Benson. I ran her cartoon today about um, uh, President Obama's plan for community colleges. She is very conservative and does not like President Obama. The other one, she is with the uh, San Diego Union Tribune. Um, there is another cartoonist I like, Jim Morin from the Miami Herald, who is very liberal and will go after the, politi the Republican political leaders and so forth. But in both cases, sometimes they will take their little image and go too far, making fun of, uh, making fun of, you know, I think, in a distasteful or unfair way. I think people who are in political power, such as the President or John Boehner or Governor Markell, Mayor Williams and so forth, are more open to uh, 
ridicule from a cartoonist than the average citizen or the supposed typical person of one group or another. Uh, so that's, I, I think that's an important thing you have to keep in mind is that the decisions about which cartoons um, or columns go into a, a newspaper or a magazine or on television or online are made by the people there following the standards of their organization if they're part of an organization the ethics that they adhere to. The Gannett Company, for example, which owns the News Journal, has, um, has this, uh, an ethics policy. Um, it really doesn't deal with cartoons much. The News Journal has one uh, that gets a little more uh, to the point of uh, uh, dealing in fairness and so forth. But, um, and, and then I have my own set. I used to be the ombudsman for the paper and dealing with the ethical issues, and I've done a number of seminars on ethics for journalists. So I have uh, thought about this a lot, um, and I've worked in several newspapers, and again, they're all different. The choice of a cartoon, to my mind, is the point of the cartoonist. Now, I would not run uh, any of the cartoons that were in the Paris Magazine. Um, First of all, because it's a different style than Americans are used to, than our readers are used to, and also because of a lot of the, the, uh, uh, the, the subject matter, making fun of the Pope or the prophet. You know, we wouldn't, I wouldn't use either. Now, um, would I take one that went after someone for, uh, who had political power and was very sharp and very disrespectful? Yes, I would. And I have done that, and I would continue to do that. Uh, to follow up on Pro Professor Kahn's uh, remark about defending him, I get complaints every time I run columnists, no matter who they are. For example, George Will is a conservative columnist. We run him on Sunday, just below former Senator Ted Kaufman, who is a liberal. And I get people saying, you must ban Kaufman from the paper. He shouldn't be in there, and so forth. And I ignored it. Then I also get letters from people saying, you must ban George Will. He shouldn't be in there because basically I disagree with his point of view. I ignore those too. My point doing this, my job I see every day of doing this is to provide a variety of points of view, some that I do not agree with. Um, it's the same thing with letters, columnists, cartoonists, and so forth. To get them out, to stimulate discussion, but to keep it within a realm of civ uh, civility and uh, uh, a thoughtful, as much as we can, conversation in Delaware about the, the important topics. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Uh, next medium is Sister Sadia Karim, who is an expert in Islamic finance, and we are grateful to her that she agreed to come and speak today. Thank you. I'm not an expert, just a researcher. Salam alaikum, peace be with you all. One of the beautiful gifts from our Creator that we all share equally is time. All of us who are here today have this thing in common that is 24 hours a day. Being a Muslim woman, a mother, wife, I play many roles and responsibility in the house for my work, and there is hardly enough time to pay attention to something like a cartoon. And if we probably, I don't know if there is any poll taken, but if we would take a poll about how many Muslims in the world have heard about the magazine before the horrific incident happened, I'm sure it would be very, very low. The point is, we allocate our time in a certain way based on our roles and responsibilities that we play. Obviously, terrorists do not allocate the time the same way. It seems like the career is terrorism. This is just to put the perspective about the difference between average human being, whether it's a Muslim or non-Muslim or any, any uh, human crew, human being and the difference uh, with the terrorism. 
my perspective is from entrepreneurial perspective, and I see things in a problem solution way. And I wrote down a few things that I'm going to share in five minutes. Terrorism is a problem, a dangerous one that is threatening the lives of all people. We need to solve this problem. By saying this, I don't put illogical expectation that we can eliminate this crime altogether and overnight because it is beyond human capacity to eliminate evil intent from the minds of evil people. What I mean is we need to solve this problem by first coming together, no matter who we are, and exert our efforts within our capacity by weakening this threat of terrorism so that it doesn't affect us in the magnitude that is affecting us today. A couple of years back, during a business communication seminar, webinar actually, that I attended, the speaker, who was not a Muslim, he was an American leadership trainer, and I don't remember his name, but I remember something that he said because I wrote it down at that time because it was so interesting. He said, probably he was a futurist, he said, in the upcoming decade, the world will be so chaotic, people will be so confused, that if something is presented to them with clarity, simplicity, and fast, people will buy it even if it is an outright lie. And he said that around the time when Arab Spring was happening. The key word that I took from there is confusion. To solve the problem of terrorism, we, all human beings, who want to leave our children in a less chaotic world, need to remove the confusion. I, as a Muslim, if I have, I need to remove the confusion about the faith that I practice, then I have to remove the confusion from my children who I am raising, then from my families, my friends, then my neighbors who are not Muslims, and then from the world through the use of pen. My brothers and sisters in humanity who are present here today, you need to remove the confusion by reading by learning more about other faiths, other cultures. We all need to develop the habit of thinking from others' perspective by learning more about people who don't share the exact same lifestyle, faith, or culture like us. So removing the confusion is the first step. The second step is to remove strong emotion, or I should say, disciplining the strong emotion. Fear, as Brother Shalid was saying, is a very powerful emotion. So is anger. When it is imbalanced and extreme, it leads us to make the wrong choices. And we can discipline our emotion. It is not impossible. We need to learn how to do it. Living in fear will only help making bad choices and help those who want our bad choices. We cannot afford that anymore. Let me repeat this again, because one of the implications of this terrorism is fear. Living in fear will only help making bad choices and help those who want our bad choices. And we cannot afford that anymore. I would like to quote Karim Abdul-Jabbar, NBA champion, whose uh, statement was published in Time magazine. He said, we have to reach a point where we stop bringing Islam into these discussions. I know we are not there yet because much of the Western population doesn't understand the Islamic religion. The reason is, and now I'll be quoting Hamza Yusuf, uh, founder of Zaytun Institute, and he said this addressing the Muslims, we are not suffering from the crisis of faith, but we are suffering from crisis of knowledge. I'd like to end with an anecdote. At some point of history, we left the pen on the street. Someone took it 